And the panel, usually the format is three components. The first is a five minutes quick self-introduction. Second part is I will ask them some important questions, at least I want to know. And then the third component is for you to ask also your important questions to them. All right? Helen, you first. Can you quickly introduce yourself? My name is Helen, and I work for SAV as security product owner. So my responsibility is to make sure that uh, web applications on banking and insurance are secure before they being released to a customer. I also a uh, cybersecurity enthusiast, mm -hmm. and um, I run meetups to yeah. educate women in cybersecurity on a monthly basis. And I'm part of Hack Student, where we educate kids in cybersecurity or ethical hacking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should address the two major components, right? We need a more uh, women professional in this field. Also, we need a younger generation to get that awareness start from early stage. Perfect. All right, Dennis? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Dennis Chaupis. I'm a senior manager at Deloitte. I lead our vulnerability management practice here in Toronto. I have about like um, close to 12 years of experience, about nine of them at Deloitte about one year at PwC, then I spent a couple of years at, at TD Bank. Um, I've worked, and most of my clients are in the financial industry. Uh, I do have similar teams in the, across, the, across the country. So I'm happy to answer any questions on, on this space. All right, wonderful. So Bryce, can you talk something different? <laughs> <laughs> something different. <laughs> introduce, uh, we already introduced you, but say something yeah. different. Uh, so yeah, my name is uh, Bryce Samuelanik. I um, Started my career uh, in the um, armed forces uh, doing communications work, uh, supporting signals intelligence. So it's kind of where cyber started, <laughs> I'd like to think. Mm -hmm. All right, Lee? I'm still Lee. <laughs> I, Same I, I got started uh, like just like an IT grunt. Like uh, my first job was like cleaning up a, a server room, literally cleaning it, like dust bunny wiping out of the corners. Um, and then a guy got fired, and they're like, hey, you're an admin. Like, okay, <laughs> that's my story. Yeah, did you find a lot of bugs while cleaning things? Oh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was bug guy. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, so that's our elite panel here. So it's my turn to ask them some questions. And the first question, because we are talking about ethical hacking, it's a one of the domain for the whole cybersecurity, as you know. Typically, when we work in cybersecurity, so we more address the things from a defensive point of view. So we build a lot of controls, look at a strategy, look at a framework, and put a lot of uh, like a tools, software, try to defend that one. But ethical hacking is from offensive security side. So it's a different angle to look at that. So my quest first question for you guys is, why ethical hacking? Uh, or your view about offensive security versus defensive security. All right, so no specific order, anyone can jump in. So uh, I think for me, I've already alluded to it, um, is that I think offensive and defensive security are the same side, or sorry, the two sides of the same coin. Um, I think you need both uh, in order to better yourself and in order to identify uh, threats and risks that, that are uh, potentially in your environment. Correct. <laughs> um, Firm. No, I, I, you know, it's funny, as I've progressed um, as an offensive person, I noticed over time I actually end up spending more time on defense than you would think. It's very important for me to, as an offensive practitioner to understand the defensive impact of what I do. So it's not enough for me to just learn a hack and be like, cool, I, I have my own labs that I build, I do my own malware analysis, I look at artifacts I'm creating on a system, I'm looking at impact. And that way, I would never, I try my best to never do something to a client or whoever it is that I don't know or have anything to tell them about how to defend against it. Because I think, you want to talk about an unethical scenario, there's one where it's like, good luck, and I just walk away. Um, so like Bryce is saying, it's very important to contextualize both pieces as being in the same space, not two separate entities, right? And a good practitioner learns both sides. Same for the defense people. Okay. I completely agree that you have to know the bad side in order to do well on the good side. And that's uh, why we want to run um, ethical hacking as part of um, our company um, defensive side and also educational. 
Um, but I want to also add a little bit of um, why in the first place you want to run it and um, a lot of, uh, not a lot of companies, maybe right now it's becoming better, but uh, essentially it was, it's not tangible enough and people may not um, realize why it's important. And I like to compare it to something as, as a feature development, right? Um, when we have a business and create a functional feature, we want to test it, right? And if you think about security as a functional, uh, as a security feature, you want to test that feature. So how do you do that? And actually, it's a slightly different from regular testing, but it is testing. It, that's why we also call it a pen testing. Right, QA, you know, quality yeah. control of things, <laughs> right? Yeah, the only thing that I would like in the, um, between the offensive and the defensive is like them. The, the one that is defending is usually uh, blind until you actually see that something is happening, right? Once you identify like, oh, oh, someone might be here, then you need to read whatever data you may have and try to block it. Sometimes that block could be just like, you know what, I'm gonna unplug the, the plug and shut it off while the other guy may be around. So they have to know both, but I think that the one that is defending has a um, tougher job, I will say, because he needs to be right 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. One chance that he's, he's like not on his like sharpest mind uh, could be a synonymous of a leak. I'm going to agree and just push back on one piece, which is for a long time we've been saying the defender's got to get everything right, and the operator or the offensive people only got to get one thing right. There's absolute truth to that. What's made, I think, my abilities better is I started arguing against it because I say the exact same thing all the time. A good defensive team needs the offensive person to screw up once because it can be really noisy. And if you find that one thing I forgot about mm -hmm. to protect, you can cut my entire attack off. 100%. Um, so I think I agree with you 100%, and I just think the opposite is also true at the same time. Wonderful. Sorry. And, and that's why uh, offensive, defensive, um, that's why we do both um, the educational for students and kids, right? So we teach them actually offensive security um, so that they get better in defensive part. Right, so you have to have that, how people, bad guy can break that and then you can better to protect that way. You have to have that mentality. All right, cool. And also we talk about a lot of terminology here. I don't know how much you're familiar with those terminologies. Uh, Lee mentioned that, Bryce also mentioned that. Uh, not everybody from ethical hacking or penetration background. So if you don't forget, there are many terms. You have ethical hacking, you have a vulnerability management, you have a penetration test, you have a red team, you had an adversary, attacking, all kinds of those terminologies. Are they the same thing or are they, how, what's the relationship among them? So back to the panel. Maybe I can start this time. Yeah. Um, so I, Maybe we can start with a little bit basics, like white hat hacker, okay. gray hat hacker, and then black Different hat hacker. Different colors. Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, if we think um, all of them doing hacking, right? And um, actually the, the hacking itself is, is just a set of actions to get into something. It's only the goal why you do this is different, what's differentiate uh, them. So, um, if we talk about ethical hacking, which is penetration test in reality, um, it's white hat hackers also called in um, industry wide there. So it's very relevant, same thing. What did you and the black hat hackers um, doing same thing, but for sake of selling that or breaking into doing like illegal things. Okay, so from ethical or like a purpose point of view. Yes. Okay. Yes. No, I've, I, I, that's sort of um, an, an excellent answer because I think we get hung up on the technicalities of this is a VA or this is a pen test or you know this is a red team. But I, I, at the end of the day, we need to communicate risk to a business, and that is what is a driver for any of this. So you know we can't get hung up on the semantics of of, um, of what we define those as. Yeah, what I find is like um, a security professional, so for the most part, we are, I'm gonna say, mostly clear on the difference on, on those definitions. 
However, when you're on the on the client side, that's where all these comes in like very like right. gray area. Like an example, like have customers coming to me like, hey, I want a red team. I'm like, okay, perfect. This, uh, this is what it means, the implication. And I'm like, no, I just want it on this application. Okay, so you don't want a red team, you want a web application testing. Uh, no, but I want a red team. Like, okay, so. Then you, 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 you need to educate your clients, right? But unfortunately, you only get to that point when you're in front of them. Mm -hmm. So all these uh, ethical hacking, vulnerability management, penetration testing, at the end, it's gonna be like as good as, as the buyer wants. And at the end, if they wanna call it something, yeah. uh, we've been in those situations like, <laughs> what sure, I'll call, it, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll call it whatever you want, but sure. it's, it's not the right thing, but right. sure. <laughs> I pay a hundred dollars for ethyl hacking, ten dollars for <laughs> red team. So what do I pay for? <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, let's move on. Uh, obviously, you guys all have a great experience in ethical hacking or penetration test. So based on your experience, what do you call a good penetration tester? Or put it another way, if you try to hire an ethical hacker, what kind of key skills are you looking for? You go first. Sure. Um, so, what defines a good hacker in the first place? Right. Yeah. Let's let's take stick okay. with that. Yeah. Right. And then the goal of that is different thing. Yeah. So, Skills. Yeah. yeah. Um, the good hacker would know um, would have a lot of skills on network, on operating systems, um, to gain access. Uh, they would understand how technology work, how application work. Mm -hmm. Also, in addition to that, um, in order to go through the complex scenario, and we're not talking about just vulnerability check, which can a lot of scanning tools do these days. Um, we're talking about the complex break-in um, uh, kill chain, right? Yeah. Um, they need to understand the business, also how it works, what, what type of business, what they do, mm -hmm. and of course the human part around this. So all those set of uh, skills, they're very wide. It's not just like one technical skill and you are a hacker. Those are more <laughs> mostly like uh, script kiddies, we call yeah, them as well. Yeah, yeah. One, very good. Okay, wonderful. In, in my case, it's, it will depend on whether I'm hiring a, a consultant, senior consultant or a manager. Uh, if I'm looking for a consultant, I look for like deep technical knowledge. Uh, and, and yes, we'll, we'll help that individual on understanding methodology, on understanding all the business implications, what actually high means for a technical person, and why actually that may translate into a low for the business. Like you, you come with a high critical vulnerability, and the business comes and say, like, yeah, this is only one million um, that I may lose if you present that to a bank. They're like, scratch that out. You know what I mean? So it depends on which level I'm, I'm looking to hire. Those technical skills may differ, and what actually the business translation on those results and how they communicate that to non-technical people is what matters the most. Okay, good. I think I'm gonna deviate a little bit. I, I think primarily what I look for, um, there are certain technical requirements for sure, but it's more the mindset. You can have somebody that's incredibly technical, but they don't think outside of the box. They don't think, they trust the documentation, but there are countless times when you go through the documentation, it is absolutely incorrect. And that curiosity and that inquisitiveness to go through and keep um, um, going at it, and that's the secondary component is that persistence, that continual, you know, dog with a bone type of a individual, just keep going at it. Um, and that, that persistence, is, I think, makes a really good ethical hacker. The technical stuff can be taught. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like very much um, what you said because what I find is like a lot of the technical people just focus too much on the technical and when, you know what, sometimes the easy w way is just if you're you know, trying to test physical security, just, just go with a PVC person, pretend you're in a call, don't necessarily need to clone the batch, the batch car, the, just, just try it. Um, and that's Hang what out I, with what, the smokers. What, yeah. and, and, and that's what I see, like a, a lot of technical people, they just stuck with it and they are like, no, but I must resolve this. Like, no, they rethought it starts with a line of code or a router. Well, yeah. one, one other deviation, I think. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I, I was saying I, I agree. I so much agree with that. Yeah. One other um, thing that I look at when I've talked to people is I'm a big fan of weaponizing people. So, Weaponize. <laughs> okay. I, as I'm, I know, I have nothing but those evil thoughts. Uh, what I mean by that is someone might say, hey, I'm just getting into this. I really want to become a hacker or a pen tester, and I'm studying these hacking things. Like, Great, I'm proud of you. Um, 
But just kind of like Helen said, someone who has a background in networking, just general networking, I would probably have an easier time making them evil. Because I don't need you to know how to hack a network, I need you to understand networking. So that in, in your kind of educational process, you've figured out things that didn't work, or when you did this, it broke things. Mm -hmm. Well, remember that for when you're on that test. Mm -hmm. You know, a good developer, if you just convince them what evil code is, they're gonna write you some crazy malware. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's this idea of weaponizing people. In certain red teams, they have um, offensive financial people. Mm -hmm. People who are like forensic accountants who they've weaponized to simulate like financial crime and that are on red teams. Mm -hmm. right? It's not just about hacking. So I'm a big fan in taking your existing skill, something you're just naturally good at, and then figuring out how to turn that into a payload. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really effective way of looking at a candidate. Wonderful. So what I can see, you, as you can see, there's so many perspectives. And all those are very valid and interesting. Because there's no right answer for these questions. So as Lee said, we can find a very good hacker in very, one domain very deep, because nobody better than him, him or her to know these things, so he can be a good hacker. Or we can be, go very broad, so you know this, you know that, you, know, you can do multiple things that cross domains. Also, you know somebody need to have the communication skills, presentation skills, understand business, so can present you well. And you, like Bryce said, you need to have a personality. Right, so kind of uh, the way you work, how do you work, that also make you a successful. There's no one size fit all, but all those are good traits. All right, cool. Then my next question is, within the ethical hacking pra uh, practice, what do you think the most difficult part? Right, so we talk about technology, strategy, methodology, all those things. What's the most difficult? Report writing. <laughs> Report writing. That's a surprise also, but that's so I, true. Yeah, that, that, that's what my team hates. But like report writing is like, okay, I'll take right. that. One. But what, what, what I find the most difficult is, um, is staying within a scope. Because let's say they'll come to me and like, hey, I have a mobile app. I only have these three new tabs that I want you to test. And I'm like, sure. Okay. Um, but then you, you have limited functionality that you're testing, right? But sometimes you may, you may think that you have something that you need like additional data for an attempt to perform a transfer and bypass the business logic. But you're like, wait a second, that's already out of scope. Uh, PCR compliance? No, not necessarily, <laughs> I wish. Yeah. So, so staying within a scope or if you're doing a web app and you say like, you know, there's a redirect to another site, you're like, nope, that's already out. So staying with a scope is the most challenging part, and what what I need to basically be behind my tester is like, uh, like no, 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 C come back, come back, don't, yeah. don't jump out because it, it it's already. Then when you start involving lawyers and all that, that, that gets out of your control. Okay, stay within the scope. Okay, I'd, I'd say another one is um, the the preceding problem to that is defining scope. Uh, a lot of time, you made an example earlier where they're like, hey, we want a red team, and then it turns out, no, you don't, you want a two-day pen test. Um, is this, for what you're asking for versus what you're letting us do, right. Agreed. that is a massive problem. I want this scenario, but do not touch X, Y, and Z. Well, that is a contradiction. And the argument, it is, it is very difficult to convince sometimes. It depends on the culture of the organization, but to convince someone that like, you know, don't fish our users, but we want to know if we're vulnerable to a nation state. It's like, that's just a ridiculous request. Um, and you have two weeks to do it. You know, like, get out of here. Uh, so, so playing this sort of dance of initial scoping, mm -hmm. I think is something that never goes smooth, especially in the beginning. And you just sort of get better at it over time where I'm like, okay, fine, listen, if you don't want X, Y, and Z done, fine, but don't blame me later when you're like, hey, you didn't do the thing. I'm like, well, yeah, because you were difficult. All right, <laughs> stakeholder agreement. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, anyone want to comment? I, I would like to answer from a little bit different perspective, um, not from consulting firm perspective, but from insider of the company. So um, the most challenging for companies within who do such testing, uh, penetration test uh, inside, um, there always comes challenge of educating management and project management and saying that you need this 
right yeah. and we believe and you know sometimes we, <laughs> we do even um, in parallel with other tasks because uh, it's overload but um, that's the challenge and um, how often you're gonna do right and how you make uh, convince them so I think scope is also part of that they also no just just as this new part right. whatever the, the delta right it's <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's also challenging um, communication and um, the the people and management. So to make sure that they buy in and uh, proceed with those activities. Okay. For me personally, staying out of the curve. <laughs> okay. Um, it's also the most enjoyable, but being up to date on the latest techniques that are being used and also keeping up to date with stuff that's been around since 1997, like SQL injection. So it, it, the knowledge base keeps growing and growing and just uh -huh. trying to stay ahead of that. Is okay, wonderful. Awesome. <laughs> A lot of uh, learning things, not only new things, but uh, don't forget the old things. And uh, three of you, the scope and uh, the reporting, also, from, I, I have a project management background, so pretty much uh, from my point of view is a stakeholder agreement to define the scope and agree on that scope and uh, keep checking and tracking. You're hired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next time, if you want to get a job, come to here, become a moderator. <laughs> Just ask some intelligent questions. <laughs> well, I don't want to get fired very soon. Huh? <laughs> All right, okay. All right, uh, next question. So we know most difficult part. So how do we call a ethical hacking practice success? So what's the definition of success? Did I break everything called a success? <laughs> um, I had both cases to be honest, where it's like uh, empty report and it's like, wait, what? Like happens. Uh, it's rare, but happens. Uh, and for me, the definition of success is like, I make sure that my, my testers follow the methodology, make sure that they tested everything. Uh, whether they have zero, 10, or 50 observations, um, that's just the results. As long as the, the, the right methodology was tested and everything was within actually how it was supposed to be, I would call that success. Okay. I would call success being able to communicate effectively risk and the impact of that risk. Okay, so you get so your your buyer so, agree with you. And well, not just your findings. You're able to explain why this is a bad thing. Okay. So you know, to to Lee's point about when he uh, took out a city, that is a, a, an excellent way to communicate right. the impact of yeah. that risk. You need to tell story, like a lead. Yeah. You do. You really do. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I define success uh, within my teams um, um, the way if we do when we do penetration test um, or ha ethical hacking, uh, we collect certain outcome, right? Then we have a follow up. So I don't judge success only on the one test. It's a set of um, activities that define successful. And yes, you can think about. <laughs> oh, verbally success as false positive you found issues right and you're uh -huh. successful but if you twist it and think about success of your application or system and you want to make sure that it's successful in terms of security so it means secure then you look at this differently right. and you do find issues but over time you make sure that it's being resolved and you apply, um, they apply recommendations that you provide oh. as a outcome of that and they implement it. And next time you do it again and it's less, right? And so it improves over time. And I think that's what it defines success. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna completely agree with you on that. The best feeling, I can, so what I define as my success would be you know, if it's an external client or you're working internally, doing something, hey, we found a pile of stuff, here's suggestions of how you might want to fix this, coming back, and even seeing that get cut down by 30%. I think we constantly get lost in this mindset of, you know, um, whatever, pick a vulnerability that exists in your environment. And you go, well, our entire fleet is vulnerable. And then you come back a few months later and you say, you know, out of the 10,000 machines, we fixed it on 1,500. Then maybe in four months, it's 2,700. Mm -hmm. That is excellent. 
progress. To go from zero to anything is great. So to see change happen as the result of your breaking mm -hmm. stuff, I think is just the ultimate uh, compliment you can even get. Right. You know, it's a great indicator that, you know, you did a good job. Wonderful. So I, I can say it's a custom service. So you think about your customer, and we are in the business, but we also care about the customers. It's not like I break everything, I find a lot of problems, down to that, you go. I call myself success, you go. But the ultimately, you help the customer to improve their security posture, right? So the, your job is not just to dump things, you help them to improve. All right, cool. And speaking of a different practice, so um, Bryce, you're in the SOC environment, right? So uh, you're in Symantec, it's more like a technology, like a vendor. SAP, of course, the main is a enterprise resource management, all those big things. You need to meet a lot of uh, internal <laughs> requirements. And then is your Deloitte also consulting company need to run. So different practice. How ethical hacking working in different practice? There must be something differently, right? I guess to start. Um, <laughs> So um, yes, um, I think the difference um, between the, um, I guess each one is going to expect the, um, their own experience. Um, I have um, my teams working in different projects for relative short periods of time. Let's say one week they are could be testing application A, next week they switch to another one, a different, different client, different industry, so they keep rotating, so they keep applying similar knowledge that they may have identified somewhere into a different place. So um, I think that's um, the, the beauty that I can provide to, 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 to my team and the experience that I can bring to clients from my point of view. Okay, all right, cool. From a SAP perspective, um, we have multiple uh, processes and controls that we apply before our products go out for customers. And even then afterwards we monitor and continue. But within, within that, um, of course, there are different assessments that happening, right? Not just uh, ethical hacking and um, vulnerability checks uh, that part of the um, vul um, reports and testing as well that we call, and of course, um, ethical hacking. But also at the end, we have internal groups. So we do that always in development, for example, myself and my teams. But then we have external out of development, but within SAP still like safe zone, um, we call them uh, validation and they get in as uh, auditors and hackers at the, um, towards the end to make sure that um, we followed everything and we did everything and if we green, we green. Like if we go just a little bit below, they're like, no, you don't ship. Yeah. Wonderful. That's a QA for the software. Yes, it's one of the major. Do you have anything? What was the question? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> How do you apply ethical hacking in your kind of Right, that was it. Yeah. Sorry, I went down like a rabbit hole in my head. Um, at Symantec, even though it's, uh, I started at the beginning of the year, so it's kind of a new context, and it's the first time I've personally been off the uh, sort of red team, if you want, or the pen test team. What's interesting for what I'm getting to do now, which is something I've been doing personally for a while, is trying to figure out how to get around security vendors' products. Not just on a pen test, sometimes right in the middle of a pen test. And there have been times in history, it's like I go up against semantic endpoint protection, and I gotta on the fly figure out how to get around it. Or there's a threat hut team. So what's really fun for me now is applying previous experience of pen testing and red teaming and malware analysis and all that other stuff, where they go, here's our whole product stack. Uh, this time we'd like someone internal to figure out the problems before the people outside do. Um, so it's a really neat kind of like alchemy lab that's new where I just kind of get to sit there with potions and weird concoctions and just be like, you know, ha, what happens now? And that's a very different context to operating because you're not sort of actively going up against something, but you're also kind of helping bugs. Get bug bounty kind not of? Not bug bounty, sort of like development bugs. Okay. Like, yeah. did you know if I enter a pound sign, the whole thing crashes? Right. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a really new, interesting perspective mm -hmm. that I think is not traditional mm -hmm. with pen testing or red teaming, mm -hmm. but it's, that's why it's o offensive R&D. Mm -hmm. Sitting around and either figuring out how to get around something or inventing the technique mm -hmm. and then giving that to the pen testers or right. the red team to say, here you go. 
Yeah. Um, so it's a, a unique experience for me, but wonderful. It's fun. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think I think um, the way we operate is unique as well um, because there's we have a consulting component uh, which we do go out and do assessments, uh, whether they be short term or long term. You know, in terms of a red team engagement, or uh, we also offer that to our SOC clients. So we need to apply that internally to improve our our detection capabilities. So it's it's um, a hand in hand type of um, an effort where you've got. You know, our offensive security team is is developing, you know, stuff to try to bypass our internal SOC. And when they do, they say, hey, you know, you missed this. We should probably look at how do we together come up with a way to detect that. Right? So. All right. Wonderful. All right. My last question before I turn to you to ask a question is about future. So we know there are so many things, especially for cyber tech and risk. So we talk about technology as well, not just security. So there are new technology or emerging technology coming like machine learning, AI, automation, like uh, new, also from risk side, there's a lot of uh, new compliance, like uh, GDPR, all those things coming out. So what's our future for ethical hacking? Can AI do this one? Or we, whatever, automate everything? DARPA. <laughs> okay. So there was a couple of years ago, um, DEFCON a couple of years ago, and they had um, DARPA there that had a, a sort of an offensive AI and a defensive AI. And so it was doing, they were developing exploits for applications, and the defensive AI was developing inline patches at the same time. Um, probably a few years away from mass deployment of something like that. Uh, and there's always going to be a human element because it's the human element that's key for. Um, ethical hacking, to be able to think outside of the box, to be able to look at something at a problem in an unusual way. Um, if you work with machine learning and really what is called is advanced statistical analysis, is you you're only know what you know um, from a pattern recognition perspective. Um, the human element provides that that outside of that. So there will definitely be automated tools that that will make things more scalable to detect things faster, mm -hmm. um, but there will always be a human element to it. All right, human element is still important. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna get a little technical on this, but the one piece of tech that I've heard about that has impacted what I think is gonna affect especially the defenders in the next few years. Everyone talks about machine learning, AI, Bitcoin, blockchain, dark net, crap, whatever. There's something called the .NET framework. It's on every Windows system, okay? This helps people who develop in something like C Sharp or other Microsoft languages to write programs. Now, the Linux world and the Apple world also wanted this capability. So things were developed like Mono or the .NET Core, which allows you to develop in your favorite Windows language for something that can run on another operating system. Microsoft has just announced, and this is gonna take effect in 2020, that the new version of .NET is gonna combine all three of these technologies, right, just to one roof. Now what that means is, as someone who develops malware, the only language I can code in is C-sharp. I'm, I'm not a true developer, I'm a hack. Um, but I can now start focusing my development efforts to run on Windows, Linux, Apple, iOS, watchOS, tvOS, everything. It's gonna be supported on pretty much every arm. I mean, you name Compatibility it. Compatibility of the... <laughs> the technology world is providing offensive operators the tools we need. They are giving them to us, right? Just saying, hey, how great would it be to write in one language for every operating system? I didn't sleep for like two days. I was like, are everything. you kidding? <laughs> it's Christmas, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, so things like that, because I know we talk about fancy technologies like machine learning and AI. Bryce just pointed out how a Visual Basic macro still gets by Windows 10 Defender, which is actually really good antivirus. Like that's, these are macros, they're from, yeah, the 1800s, I think. <laughs> and they're still working great, I use them all the time, they're working great. So while it's an absolutely valid question, what do these new technologies offer the world of attacking and defending, I'm worried about what's currently working what I think is gonna make something interesting down the road, but we just saw how Silence, anyone see the Silence news? Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah, uh, Silence has machine learning, AI, whatever. Um, someone just appended a couple like 
bites, I think, to the end that just made it gay, made it go, oh, I've never seen that before, it's good. <laughs> that was it, so much for your fancy machine learning. Okay, I'm gonna stop being negative. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I agree that um, there will be some scenarios uh, with, who? that's my juice, never mind. Uh, some scenarios with machine learning, and actually, yeah, we have already a lot of automation around penetration tests, right? It's, it's nothing new. Um, machine learning or AI, buzzwords, quantum computing, and so on, yeah. Um, some of the scenarios would be solved with that, um, and I think we are all advancing, but we're also gonna have different level of threats with that, that we will have to prepare ourselves. and. Future of ethical uh, hacking, I think there is a lot of future. And we think, okay, today we don't have enough people in the industry who can do the job, right? And uh, with AI, we somehow will solve the problem we want. We, we're just gonna go to a different level of the problem. And people who we educate today, our high school students and kids, right, who are gonna grow up in, um, to be our ethical hackers, they will move on to that different level. There's always going to be a human aspect to solve these complex problems. Yeah. So. Okay. So human will never go away. I see this um, a little different, um, and I'm probably looking at it from from uh, top of the house all the way down because I'm trying uh, see this evolving into vulnerability management program in the whole life cycle of vulnerability where you have all everything, your pen test, your currency management, your punch management, your how you are onboarding new servers, even how you um, tie your qualities to your service now, your ERC to see everything, how all that in, into one place will actually give you how exposed or not you are. What's your actual risk posture, how your CIO, your CISO, your CRO, all, all of them are talking the same language. I and mean, for once, finally, you can see like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm worse than I thought so. So right now, yes, AI, all these integrations um, are just tools, but in the end, if there is no process, then you will have just a better view of how bad you are, and if you are not actually fixing it, then like, okay, now you're red. You were red before. Mm -hmm. You pretty much you always have a product, process, and... Uh, exactly, like yeah. people, process, technology, people. all those things together um, without the actual process, yeah. without focusing just on the tool. Yeah. Um, I think that's what the, the, the big area that we are actually helping organizations now on. So those are three Ps, people, process, product. All right, cool. All right, it's your turn now. Uh, you can ask a question for about 10 minutes. Uh, who wants to, a lot of hands raising. Uh, you first. So a question for Lee. Uh, when you were talking earlier, initially you talked about you'll only try to solve a pro identify a problem that you can solve. And if I'm a bad actor, I don't care about how it's going to be solved. I just want to break it. Yeah. So how do you take that me mentality and protect the organization? So that statement is not set in stone. Um, there are some things where we'll execute a certain technique or a tactic, whatever it is, and the solution to it is not obvious. It's not like just turn this on, you're good. Sometimes it's just by design. So I'm a big uh, Active Directory person. That's where I spend a lot of my research on. There's a lot of abuses in Active Directory that are just features, if not something that can even be fixed. So I look at it sort of like concentric circles. I'll try to get as close into the problem as I possibly can with a defensive solution, and then I'll start moving to the next layer out, next layer out, next layer out, until I can at least give you something. Um, it, in terms of like a zero day that comes out, nobody has the solution for that. It's a zero day, right? Um, then there's other situations where the capability to be tested isn't something you can do legally or even financially. So for example, there have been times where a company said like, hey, can you come hijack our cell phones, right? Well, yes, I could sit in the parking lot, set up a fake cell tower, crank the, the, vol or the power up and just suck everybody's traffic into me. I'm pretty sure I'd be breaking a lot of laws with that, right? <laughs> yeah, um, so I can't do that. Um, but then, I so it, that's sort of the reverse of the process. I then wanna say, well, okay, what's the next logical place I can get to? Um, so there isn't always an obvious solution. 
And what I'll do when I'm in the position of deciding what tactic to use, I'll try to just go with, usually what just will help me get the job done. And then I'll start saying, all right, well, if I do this, what am I gonna be able to tell them to do about it? It may mean I have to push pause on the engagement and go into our lab where we have all crazy tools and try to figure something out. A lot of the times we do come up with defensive indicators and things like that that the engineers haven't figured out yet. So, and sometimes just here's a giant pile of Windows event logs, uh, maybe you can find something. But I just, I, I feel dirty not giving them something, you know, but I, I try my best and sometimes you can't. Hope that answers. Uh, this is a question for everybody on the panel, really. Um, so I work with, with a lot of startups and mid-sized enterprises, 50 to, say, 200 people in size. And um, at that stage, they haven't really decided to invest in information security or cybersecurity yet. And I find a lot of the examples you guys have been giving are companies that have already decided to invest. They've they, they have a strategy, a budget, et cetera. How do you convince those smaller companies to make that initial investment and, and understand the risks that they're dealing with? Invite them to the meetup. <laughs> uh, like, it, it, it's going to cost them more later down the road if they, if they don't um, uh, create security within the design. Uh, small things, like even like, uh, why do you want to store the what we're we talking about, the credit card data, what do you want to say? Because I want to have the option of doing it. Like, okay, but do you actually need it? Things like that. Just review your process. Like, and doesn't need to be too expensive in terms to go all the way to actually, yeah, you need to include like a pen test on every bill and all that. No, just review the process and just design it in a secure way. It, it's more about instilling the, the mentality of security that's in their in their organization and going from there it's not a you know from day one you don't need a red team you know that's not that's not going to give them any benefit um, you know you can start smaller than that you know whether it's a, a policy um, check or, or a, a high level security assessment then potentially moving into a vulnerability assessment where you're just sort of doing some scanning and saying you should really keep your patching up to date and things like that just to start that subculture and then if you build it at the beginning, it's much easier than, you know, as you said, after the fact, it's going to be much more uh, difficult to, to retrofit. Yeah, something that we've been doing a lot is uh, um, training to developers because they say, oh, yeah, no, we are doing uh, stack DevOps. But then when you talk to them, like, uh, no, no one has actually security training, but we're doing it. Like, but how? So just tr it's something like a simple training with them, one, two, two days, whatever, uh, helps. So another, another area of that is Bryce's entire topic of his talk. You know, the, the things that could have stopped some common breaches. There's a, there's a few realities here and context is gonna be important, but one could argue the smaller you are, the smaller of a foot attack surface that you have. Now, if I do get in, you don't have the resources of a larger company to necessarily defend. So that's kind of one David and Goliath scenario. Um, another is the basics work really well, really well. I can tell you this as, Someone who's done a lot of attacking. Um, what you really are trying to do, because this falls in line with the concept of risk, is increase offensive operational cost. If you make it economically difficult for me, or logistically difficult for me, or too time consuming for me, most attackers don't have too much patience. If they do, you're in trouble, because a targeted patient adversary is a hell of a thing to fight. But just the basics, 2FA, password hygiene, uh, that machine should never talk to that machine. Those things really make life difficult. So sometimes the basics are huge. Yeah. So I just have one small anecdote to add to that. I, I, way back when, when I did my CISSP, the instructor there said, how, should, how should secure should your home wireless be? And everybody started answering with you know, high technical answers. He says, no, no. You need to be this much more secure than your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> you run past that when a car hits you, so you run past that car. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is from uh, multiple perspectives. One is like from incident response and from ethical hacking perspective. 
whichever examples you showed right now were all windows based so what we are seeing is like 90 per, i mean all the cases are windows based are you seeing cases in different environments or certain nascent technologies where basically um there is a there is a lot of prospect for like say tools or anything which has not been developed yet and which would be very useful for incident response or from a pen test perspective even in the case which uh, you showed i think that entire environment was mostly windows based because domain admin and i'm i'm guessing there so are there like let's say even linux like servers are being run on linux like it is a highly concentrated market but i don't see pen test or incidents happening in that environment and second one more question was from like uh, deloitte perspective you do vulnerability management since 9 years 10 years so how um, how does it apart from the brand name how do you differentiate like there are a lot of or organizations doing bas and pen test how does it differentiate itself from everyone like how how what uh, unique what how does it like what is the unique selling point like there So if I can understand from an incident response perspective you're asking do we see a lot of attacks on on Linux systems specifically or Linux or other things other environment you see a lot of cases Docker or Linux or something like that but Sure so so those do exist but um and they're um maybe not as common because active directory is such a huge Uh, attack base and every organization has active directory so it's a, it's a it's it's a, a a very meaty sort of target um but there has been uh, i mean like i said sql injection has been around since 1997 um there are absolutely attacks that go on the linux platform um and even i'm not even sure i can talk about it because it's <laughs> <laughs> the type of it's it, it's in the power industry um and and you know there were there was a response on on system control systems that were supposed to be air gapped um and what ended up happening it was a usb jumper that a technician brought in because there was no policy about having usb um um from you know the organization you could bring in your any 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 um usb and it was it was it was it was a drive by but it 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 had been there for 3 or 4 years before somebody detected it so um so yeah so um why do we go after windows because it's is is the guy that is everywhere right so and sometimes you will need that as a jumping point to get to a linux box because it, you rarely ever will have uh, something that uh, like that exposed but you may but uh, you know what i mean you you go you go for that uh, but then to answer your your circle question um Right now we the way we're definition definition ourselves is by testing the business logic try using what they have built all the the functionalities and how we can leverage that in order to uh perform for example unauthorized transactions elevate privileges not necessarily looking for a for a zero day or you know escalation and move lateral just test the business logic and how as you were mentioning um, earlier like have that out of the box right I'm just being a little more um I don't know like um I have better ideas or different ideas on how we'll use that to make uh to get something that will give me money later whether that's data whether that's just uh, money transactions or something like that. Uh hello good evening. Um the presentation was very interesting. Uh how do pen testers protect themselves from liability in case of causing damage inadvertently and secondly um how does uh, pen testers determine in terms of uh, applications they're checking for example a web server in the organization who knows that they're actually doing the pen test so the first answer to that is cyber insurance um and you do have to get uh permission to test in an organization and then at um there is a process that you go through to identify and make sure a uh, questionnaire that you you identify is this running on a third party hosting because then you have to notify the third party hosting so you do that's part of your your scoping and you do have to clarify that up front um because you know um oops uh, i accidentally hacked something that wasn't in scope is not an excuse uh from a legal perspective 
I think also at a um, kind of a quasi-technical level. I'm, I'm such a big proponent of building labs and teaching people how to build labs because if I can figure out that, oh, hey, that will destroy your database in the lab, then whew, good thing I figured that out first, not in your production environment. Or sometimes when I'm really uncomfortable, I'll ask if they have like a, a replication staging environment where it's just an exact copy and if I break it, minimal damage, right? Um, but again, this comes back to sort of researching both sides of the coin. The more I spend time with defense or if I'm working on an exploit and then I try it and it blue screens the computer, I'm glad I figured that out in my lab. Um, so it's just kind of, you know, they're cautionary tales, really. It's just, you know, don't touch hot surface. I would even say, uh, we were talking about uh, customers, right, and consulting, but even within the company, like SAP, I cannot just go somewhere as a team, take their application and start hacking. That's gonna be like, you fired. <laughs> Yeah, and just to add to that, yes, for example, until recently, you had to notify your, your cloud vendors, whether that's GCP, uh, sure, you name it, like, hey, uh, I'm going to run a test, uh, uh, FYI, but now they actually, they changed the rules. You can just, just do it. So uh, that's easier for me because it's less paperwork, but if actually I get in and something happens, um, then like, okay, um, I hope you had a backup. <laughs> and we can only take the last two questions. Yeah. Tell us about your perfect Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your knowledge sharing. I really appreciate that. And Lee, really nice presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, my question to you is like, always see, to you, all of you, of course, uh, uh, you always go to the C suit, they always need some points to you know, fix the vulnerability or something. So in case of advanced persistent threats, what would be the five or four points you would give to a C-suit to fix? To see <laughs> I, think, I think you have to apply context there because uh, the reality is, there, uh, you know, advanced persistent threats only account for 13% of attacks globally. And when I say globally, I'm including, you know, military and, and other organizations where there would be a definite higher concentration there. So, and then it just goes, the second part to that is, you know, just doing the basics again, right? Making sure that you have your, your MFA if you've got a public facing, um, you know, credentialed login. Um, just, you know, getting back to that, it, it will, as I said, being this much more secure than your neighbor, right? So that you're not a specific target. I think too, what, what's, this doesn't translate necessarily from organization to organization. Uh, one of the things that made me very happy when I joined Symantec is our, our uh, recent CISO, David Bradbury, like sits in on the calls with, with us. Something that most people would be like, that's beneath my station. Um, he's just very like, he's Australian guys. So he's like, all right guys, what did you get on tonight? And uh, he takes a vested interest in like, how does that work? How does that work? What does that mean? So that when he has to go report, he gets it. Um, I think that's very cool. But in terms of what would those key pieces be, I think similar to Bryce's point, a major component when any time the APT thing comes up is let's, not in, the, not in the context of application development, let's talk about threat modeling for a second. If you are worried about a nation state, good luck. I you know no one can really help you. Um, there's some truth to that. It's not 100% it's not correct. But again, it comes down to, well, how realistic is this as a threat for us? If we, let's say it's true, well, what capabilities would you require to fend off a threat like that? Is that gonna cost $20 million and stuff? Do we have to hire like a mercenary group to come in? Do we have to hire, you know, some hitmen to get on a plane and go over there? What do we gotta do? It's just probably not very realistic. So the kind of like uh, the other point of make your Wi-Fi of the neighbor you know, worse than yours, um, that can sometimes help. But again, the, I, there's a totally unique context to how you measure threat when you're talking about the advanced world. Right? And I'm not even a huge fan of advanced persistent threat as terminology, but things change drastically when that's in your threat model. Right? It's, it's a whole nother ball game. So my five tips to them would be like, we don't need to worry about this. <laughs> yeah, the only thing that I would add is that um, 
sometimes the, the C-suite will know like the worst case scenario, right? What those APTs can do. But what they want to hear is what's my residual risk? What are all these 20, 50, or maybe one control that I have in place? And like, okay, that's what it means maybe for the, for the world, but for us, this means only this potential uh, impact. And this may translate into X time of, of money or this specific scenario. And we can actually protect us within the next X hours or X days and we'll be okay. And they were like, okay, now I can go back to sleep if they can. All right. You got it? Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.